got a couple more people trickling in. So yeah, let's go. All right. Can you guys see my, can you see my screen, Gibby? Yes. Okay. Is that the quote by Michael? Yeah. Yes. All right. First off, uh, thanks to everyone who showed up tonight. Um, we want to start off with a quote and let that resonate throughout the presentation is if you quit once, it becomes a habit. Never quit. And that was said by Michael Jordan. And obviously, <laughs> we know what kind of career he had. So just stay with it. I know not every night's going to be a good night. We're going to fail a lot. But just don't quit because that will become a habit. So with that, I will pass it to Stacy to screen share and Gibby and I will introduce our presenters for tonight. All right. You mean you, mean you will present them? <laughs> I will introduce the presenters for tonight. <laughs> You got it? Yeah. Put it on. Yep. Uh, there you go. All right. So tonight we've got Stacy and Doug presenting on two person coverage. And starting off with Stacy, she started officiating in 2000. She's worked the state tournament and been a finals official in the past. She is a women's college official working Division II and below. She has international experience in Australia at the World Master Games. And she's a board member for the SOWB and PMBOA. She's also spent many years giving back, training new officials, and has a training camp that Gibby also helps out with. So Gibby, if you want to give a quick touch on that camp. Uh Unfortunately, uh, because of COVID-19 uh, this year, we haven't been able to uh, uh, have the camp, but we are thinking about doing an online camp during the uh, first weekend in December. And uh, stay tuned because uh, uh, more information will come out uh, uh, sometime in the middle of, this, of November. Yep. And that's referee school, correct? Uh, basic uh, referee training. It's called referee, referee, referee basic, basic training. training. Right. We had to change the name once Pilly, Penny's affiliation left when she went to Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. Leslie's also involved with that cap. It's her, me, and Gib. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll send out more information as it comes. Yeah. Next on the board here is Doug. Uh, Doug joined the PMBOA in 1992-1993. He's worked multiple state tournaments here in Washington for both the PMBOA and SOWB. He served as the PMBOA Training Academy Director, Clinician, and Administrator. And he's been a board member for the PMBOA holding multiple positions for over 15 years now. So again, a lot of experience out of these two and Please take notes today. You're going to learn a lot. OK, I'm going to stop this real quick because I want to make sure that I shared. I didn't optimize for video. OK. OK, here we go. All right, Doug, you're up. All right, great. Thanks to everyone for being here tonight. Um, we're going to talk about two-person mechanics and a refresher. Uh, Two-person mechanics are very important with the upcoming uh, season, depending on how many officials are working, uh, the need to work two-person mechanics uh, may uh, come to the forefront for everyone. Uh, moving on to pregame, just to br briefly go some, uh, through some things here. Um, be sure to have a good pregame uh, with your partner as it will prevent many issues during the game. Uh, you want to arrive on the court 15 minutes prior. Give yourself plenty of time to get out to the court. Uh, at 12 minutes, you'll have the captain's meeting. This should be professional. Get the captain's assistance with issues during the game. This way, um, you can get their buy-in and their help anytime you have an issue out there. 10 o'clock, you're going to check. The referee will check the book. 
Um, when you're over there, make sure you meet uh, your table as the referee and uh, sure the players on the court match what's in the book and um, sign the book for both officials and write legibly so they know who officiated the game, good or bad. If you did a really great game, they, they can send in a, 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 a note to someone saying, hey, these officials were great. Um, and then also when you're over there at the 10 minute mark, get your game ball, get that so it's prepared so you're not trying to get it last minute. Um, two minutes, you're gonna meet the coaches. Um, you'll go to the visiting coach first. Um, you're gonna ask if the players are properly equipped, medical professional, if there's a medical professional trained in concussion management. And um, then you're gonna go to the home coach, do the same thing. Make sure you meet uh, the table as the umpire uh, over there. And then hopefully we'll get ready to play after the uh, pregame festivities. All right. All right. Um, start. I'm hearing a lot of feedback, but that's okay. Start between uh, periods and timeout positioning. Hey, Doug, hold on a second. If anybody's not muted, please mute yourself. Okay, Thank you, Stacy. Like Appreciate that. I'm sorry, someone said they had a question? Yes, Doug Peyton here. Yes, Peyton. Sorry, I was on a headset there. I didn't pick up. Why why do we wait till two minutes before the game to do the game? Invariably, that's when the coaches are trying to call their teams over. They've got some last minute instructions. We come over, we've got to break into the huddle, interrupt them. Why not do it earlier? So there, there's a couple of uh, thoughts on that. If you want to go a little bit early, you're welcome to do that. I personally like to go at two minutes because you know what? They're getting ready to start. Let's get this over with and move on. Sometimes coaches want to ask a lot of questions about this and that. And um, that's what has been determined um, by the WOA and the NFHS that we should go over there at two minutes. If you guys want to make an adjustment, that's something you should talk about in pregame. Okay, does that answer your question, Peyton? Yes, it does, thank you. All right, no problem. All right, so moving on to pregame positioning. Um, let's see here. Uh, Stacy, were you able to fix this slide or is this slide still? I did. No, I fixed it, I added some things, so yes. Okay, it's... cool. So in the book, um, the slide is wrong, but so this uh, slide is actually correct. Uh, the referee, um, you're gonna position yourself opposite the tables opposite the table on the benches, you're watching the teams. The referee will be watching the visitor, visiting team, and the umpire will be watching the home team during warm-up. Uh, when the referee goes to the table to check the book uh, at uh, 10 minutes, the umpire should move to midcourt and observe both teams. Um, at halftime, um, it, uh, the only thing that's gonna change is because the teams are on a different end, the referee and umpire will swap sides. So the referee is again watching the visitor and the umpire is again watching the home team. All right, moving on between quarter, quarter positions. Um, first of all, um, the umpire um, will be uh, right at the uh, uh, the center circle division line uh, opposite side of the jump circle uh, between quarters responsible for ensuring subs are court to the table on time. And um, the referee will be facing the table, holding the ball on the hip, facing the direction of the play opposite the table. Okay, moving on, next slide, please. Uh, full timeout positions, the administering official um, and this is both for full and 30-second uh, timeouts, which we'll talk about right after full timeouts. But the administering official stands at the inbound spot uh, where the ball is going to come into play, holds the ball on the hip facing the direction of play. If the throw-in is front, in front of one of the benches, get out on the floor away from the team. Uh, that way you uh, are not being... Um, asked questions by the coaches or you're in the way of their uh, timeout, um, proceed, timeout uh, during the timeout. The other official, the off official will stand on the division line on the far side of the jump circle um, facing the table. Okay, 30 second timeout. 
Next slide there. It should be there. And uh, 30 seconds. There we go. I see it now. Um, the only difference on this is the um, off official. The off official stands on the division line on the near side of the jump circle, closer to the table. All right, moving on to jump ball. So the jump ball, let's, let's be sure we get the game off to a great start. The jump ball is, like, is, is, is really like a lost art. We only do it once a game now, unless you happen to have overtime. So we wanna get it right when we go out there. First of all, the umpire will be table side uh, with their back to the table. Um, make sure you're not blocking the timer so they can actually see what's going on. Sometimes you have a table that might be a little bit low and if you stand there blocking them, they can't see what's going on. So you may need to move slightly to the right or left so that they can see things. Uh, when the ball is properly tossed, you're gonna chop the ball when it's touched. Uh, look for violations um, uh, and, and look for violations and or possible fouls. The referee will be facing the table on the opposite side of the center circle. They're gonna go in, blow their whistle, um, drop the whistle out of the mouth. You don't want that missile whistle in your mouth because you don't want to lose some teeth when you uh, go in there in case you accidentally get hit on the jump ball. Practice your toss. The toss should be just higher than the uh, highest the jumpers can jump. So you'll have to make an adjustment if you're working a, a fourth grade game versus a high school varsity game. Uh, so you need to practice and make it an athletic toss. Um, once you toss the ball, be still until the player's clear. Um, umpire, if the toss is bad, this is something that happens an awful lot. Make sure you call it. Okay. It's not an ego thing. Let's start the game off right. And let's get that toss right. Um, the ball must go um, high enough so that the downward flight is higher um, than the players jumped when tip on the, on the downward flight. After the jump ball. Okay. Uh, usually the umpire will be the lead depending on the situation, but you need to uh, look at the situation and adjust based on what happens. Um, the umpire should follow the ball in any contested possession. So if you have a defend or you have two players, one from each team going for the ball and they're charging at it in backcourt, you as the umpire need to go towards that. And even if the um, player, uh, the new offensive player is going the other direction, you will end up being the trail. Um, but most times you're able to secure it and go to the lead position. So you will be the lead. Um, the referee should hold position until players clear and then position opposite the umpire. So see what's going on, see where the umpire has gone, and then position yourself in proper uh, area to start coverage within, so you can see the 10 players. Um, do we have any questions um, in the chat so far? Guess not, no? No, no if questions. If not, then let's move nope. to state. All right. Could I say? Could I? Up. Could I mention something about the? Yes. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Uh, the uh, ten minute and twelve minute mark. When when yes. you when you are on the floor and meeting the captains, I will say I will advise you to go to and check the book right after the captains meeting because there is a penalty if the starters are not putting the book at the ten minute mark. So you want to give yourself some time to rectify if either team or neither team has the starters in the book. That's it. And I'd like to add one thing onto what uh, Gib just said. The names don't need to be in the book at the 10 minute mark. They need to be at the table at the 10 minute mark. So that's a misconception that I just, um, I just like so, to hide. So obviously you want, you want to, you don't want to have to start out with a technical foul. If everything's there and they're working on filling it out, then take care of business. And, you know, Gib, Gibby's right. Make sure you're there. You know, I will always go at, immediately after I finish my captain's meeting, go over to the table and check the book. That gives me a little bit extra time to get that taken care of. So 
points well taken. There's a, a question, um, hasn't pregame process changed because of COVID? Um, there, uh, you know what, we haven't really talked about any COVID procedures for basketball yet. Uh, we're going through what the current um, procedures are. If we have to make some adjustments with COVID, then we will do that. Yeah, yeah. and Go ahead, can Bob. I jump in here? Yeah, yeah. so Absolutely. Tony, great question. Uh, as Doug said, that hasn't been figured out yet. However, just thinking down the road, we do have cell phones and we do have Zoom or Google Meet at our hands. So I know for me personally, if I have a game and we have to show up to the gym dressed, I'll more than likely be taking my pregame on the road or when I get there in my car by calling my partners and getting them on a conference call. So we'll have to adjust to the current situation that we're in, but it's very important to touch base with your partners, even if it's a 10 minute conversation, um, anything is better than nothing. Yeah, and, and you know, if the high schools follow what the colleges are doing, um, we'll probably are going to have to show up dressed. We probably won't have locker room facilities to take showers and we'll probably uh, revise the whole captains and, uh, coaches meeting. So uh, we're just going to have to see what falls out, but just we'll, we'll let you, you guys know as soon as we know. Okay. Um, primary coverage areas. <clears throat> we all know what these are. So this corner here, this free throw line extended to the sideline down to the end line. This is the leads primary coverage area or PCA and all the rest of this big area is the trail. So uh, basically that means that the lead needs to work their butt off or the trail needs to work their butt off because that's a lot of real estate. And, and a reminder that these lines are guidelines, but they will not remain rigid for the game. Sometimes you need to, you need to go into your primary's primary coverage area because your, your partner, because your partner's refereeing something else and there's matchups that need to be covered. So these are guidelines. All right, lead coverage front court. Uh, the lead needs to, <clears throat> will be working between the um, close down and the wide position, mirroring the ball. We've all heard that. So the ball's out wide, the lead will be out wide. As the ball moves to the court, the lead will go to the close down position, back and forth. The whole reason why you're moving is you're working to get, keep the ball in your periphery and to get good angles. Um, if, if the ball goes, Below the free throw line extended into the lead's primary coverage area, the lead needs to accept the ball. And it's very important that this gets talked about in pregame, especially if you're working with somebody you haven't worked with before. Uh, you need to let each other know how you're going to accept the ball, what that looks like, so that your partner knows that, uh, will know when you pick the ball up. Um, in this case, in this picture here, the mechanogram, I guess we call them, the lead call, the, the pass comes into the leads area. The lead picks up the primary matchup, attempts to keep this matchup in his periphery or her periphery. But if the ball's down here, the trail should be coming around the backside and should be helping on these matchups down here. This is one of those instances where I said where the lines are guidelines and they're not, they're not hard and fast rules. Uh, there are times when the lead's going to want to go over to the trail side of the floor, um, either to get a better position to see the play or to be closer to a play they might call and make the call more believable. So in this case, the lead comes across. There's, an, there's a, a cutter coming across the paint and an entry pass right here. Um, and so if there's Obviously a defender will probably be coming in to make this play interesting and the lead would be making this call. Um, one thing I failed to mention is that the lead's generally not gonna come across in this situation while the ball's way up high. They're not gonna normally come across until the ball is in the vicinity of the free throw line extended or below, okay? Um, when the lead does come across, however, the lead needs to remember that his primary coverage area is still this. And so during the rotation, the lead's head and shoulders need to be facing towards the paint 
so that they can cover these matchups before this before this cut happens. There might be a file back here before the before this action ever occurs. Um, and the last uh, reminder is that the trail will remain on their side of the floor no matter what the lead's doing. So just because the lead comes across doesn't mean that the trail should go across. If, if there's a transition and we're in this position, then it's, up, it's the lead's responsibility to work their way back to the other side of the floor so we can continue play on the other end. All right, trail coverage in the front court. Biggest thing for the trail is the trail needs to work the arc. Means as the ball goes back and forth uh, on the court, the trail is going to move back and forth with it uh, in an arc mostly parallel to the three point line. Um, since this area way on the opposite side of the floor is in the trails coverage area, the trail may need to come out as far as the mid court line, the mid court long way line. Um, and that's okay. But if this, if this uh, matchup isn't super competitive, the lead doesn't have to come out here and be super aggressive on it. You know, you can come out maybe half this far and referee that as well as some other matchups that might be going on. Um, on the second picture, there's a shot from the top of the key and it shows that the trail movement should be down towards the end line so that the trail has good through the paint coverage for rebounds. Um, one thing that I didn't mention, I'm gonna go back to this first picture again. As the ball goes across the trails area, the trail is gonna to go towards it to remain about a third of the floor away from it. That's not what I wanted. Once the ball drops into the leads coverage area, the trail needs to go the opposite direction and look through from the backside to help out with plays in here. And then if the ball pops back up again, then the trail is going to come back up to meet it. Don't hang up up here, hang out up here. If the trail, if the leads got the ball in their primary coverage area, you're absolutely no help. Okay, last picture. The lead comes across to help on this play and there is a pass into the post. So the lead's focus is right here. But these, these two players, these four players here are probably jostling and going for a rebound. And again, this is where the trail has to expand their coverage area and cover this action while the lead's covering the shot. Are we good so far? Okay, um, I have a clip here. It's, it's about four minutes. Uh, the, the, there, there's gonna be a play that plays through and then there's a voiceover uh, where the, a gentleman is diagnosing the movements of the lead in the trail. So let me, I have, I'm going to see if I can get this up here real quick. Where's my share screen? There it is. Okay, can everybody see that? <laughs> Can, can you see this play? I haven't started yes. it yet. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay, so just listen through. We're going to see the play once. There's going to be a foul at the end of it, and then the voiceover will take over. Now let's look at a two-person game and the actions of the crew. Let's focus on the trail in this situation. Look at this on-ball matchup and just think about what the relative intensity of this matchup is and how much attention we need to give to this matchup, right? Team has brought the ball into the front court. They're initiating their offensive action. If we have a low intensity matchup here as trail, that gives us the opportunity to officiate additional action and see what's going to happen next. Ball goes to the wing. This is our on-ball matchup. How would we describe the intensity of this matchup? Not much going on. Kick back out. Notice how the trail, since we have a low intensity matchup here, the trail maintains his attention on the ball, on the player who just had the ball, who's cutting. And we have screening action in the trail's primary 
off ball. Body position open to the court. Since this matchup doesn't require a lot of attention, gives us freedom to officiate off ball. Determines this screening action is legal. Now resumes attention on ball. The ball goes into the lead's primary. What do we expect the trail to do? Step down. Step down for rebounding action so you can see through the players. All the players are, are, are basically positioned north to south here. Right? You need to see between these players, between these players, and between these players. And that can be accomplished by stepping down. Free throw line extended would be expected. Free throw line extended. See how it is open look on this play? Perfect position as trail for rebounding action. Players are competing. All right, we got arm contact by the defender, called by the trail. Love it. All right, now let's look at the lead. So we've got post action opposite. What's the relative importance of this matchup, this matchup? These are freezing cold competitively. This post action is our matchup of interest. So it looks like lead is, is willing to come across and work strong side as lead, but then it dissipates, right? Once the ball is swung here and kicked back out on top, the intensity of that post, post matchup dissipates. So we back out. Note. Open body position, open to the court. Could be a little bit better. We had screening action here. We are potentially going to have screening action here. Need to be aware of this. Not there, right? We had another possible screening action here. But note the body position mirroring the ball. When the ball went from here to here to here and now to here, Mirroring the ball as lead. Obtaining an open look on the play. Maintaining an open look on the play. Lead. Looking for the point of contact. Properly indicating a three-point try. Staying with the shooter. Up, down, and a little bit more. Then officiating rebounding action. Maintaining an open body position, open to the players. So again, let's look. Okay. I'm not going to play it again. He goes through a review of what he just said. Uh, I, I like what he has to say. There are two Two places where I think the crew could have done better that he didn't mention. One, when the ball goes into the lead's primary area, the trail does drop down, but he takes a long time to do that. That should, that should be immediate once the ball goes in, into the lead's primary coverage area. Um, I'll show you right here. Boom. So the ball goes into the primary coverage area of the lead. This guy should be stepping down. If it comes back out, he can always come back out. So I thought he was a little slow doing that. And then the other thing is once the foul call is made, uh, the, the trail official does not stop and do color number fouls consequence at the spot. He's rushing to the table before he even. Uh, now let's look at a two person. He's letting his, his, his uh, partner know what's going on. Is there any any questions or are there any uh, is there any discussion about this play that anybody wants to uh, jump in on? Doug, did you want to say anything? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think uh, the, these, this crew did a really good job. They um, adjusted based on where the ball was. They you know released the ball and uh, you know between the two officials. Uh, they were both engaged. I thought it was a really good, uh, officiate, well officiated play. Okay. 
I need to get us back to where we were. Okay, here we go. Can everybody see um, pass and crash? Yep. Okay, so um, this is a situation that happens in many, many games. Uh, it's really difficult to officiate with only two refs, but uh, what it is is there's a drive to the basket and the driver dishes the ball off to one of the other wings and then crashes into a defender. Okay, according to National Federation, what we want to do is uh, the, the area to which the pass goes needs to be covered by the referee who is responsible for that area, and then the other official needs to cover the crash. So in this instance, the pass goes from here to further into the leads area. So the lead's going to have to cover the, the pass, and the trail's going to have to cover the crash. Likewise, if the pass goes out here, then the trail needs to cover the crash and the leads or the pass and the lead needs to cover the crash. I know some people like to pregame it differently and give the lead all the crashes and so forth and so on. And, and you know, but by the book, if the pass goes into your area, you need to pick up the pass and the other official needs to pick up the crash. And, and Stacy? Yes. And and just to make sure that it doesn't matter if the person that is supposed to have that area and doesn't make a call, make sure that you have a whistle. Just because it's not your your area, uh, don't say, "Well, that's not my area," so I, I, that crash is not is not my responsibility. So make sure that that there is a whistle on that play. Yeah, totally agree. And and honestly, for the most part, the crash is going to be the play that everybody sees. You know, there might be, a, you know, a foul on a shot from the wing where the pass goes to. It's not going to be nearly as dramatic as the crash that just happened. So I totally agree. Somebody needs to have a whistle on that. Doug. All right. Thanks, Stacy. Great job. Uh, we're going to move on to double whistles. Um, never had one of those. Oh, just kidding. Uh, in a, in a two person game, there should be fewer double whistles, uh, hopefully than in a three person game. But if you happen to have one, how you handle these can reflect on the success or failure of the game. Communication during pregame is critical on how to handle these situations. Uh, being game aware when there's a double whistle will save the crew. So the keys on double whistles. Number one, have good eye contact with your partner. If there's a double whistle, one person has an open hand, the other person has a closed hand, probably one of the two happened first. And if you talk about that in pregame, I had a travel before your foul, Stacy, and I take it, uh, and we get the travel, and that way we're not having a blarge. Uh, understand where the play originated from. It starts in the trails area, and if the foul is on the defender that guarded them all the way to the basket, the uh, trail will have that call. If it's a secondary player step in, stepping in, then it would be the lead. Um, so we need to understand where the play originated and whose primary call it would be. Understand the primary areas, which I just talked about. And number four, allow the proper official to make the call. So if you both go up and have a fist, whose call should it be? It should be the person, the official who whose primary coverage area it was. Obviously, there are other situations. If someone's had five calls in a row and you want the other person to take it, that might be a different situation. But for the most part, um, allow the proper official to make, to make the call. All right, we have a couple passing or a, a couple of uh, charge, um, uh, block charge calls and drives to the basket. So Stacy's going to T officiates, the trail officiates the primary defender lead officiates the secondary defender, which is what I just talked about. All right, Stacy, take it off. Take over. Uh, Let's see if I can bring him up here, please. Okay. Hold on. Hey, we have a. We have a what? No, I, I was going to talk about the play, so.
<laughs> right, this is a crew discipline play. Super easy charge call. This play completely belongs to the lead. Fast break. All defenders are secondary. Lead has first crack. In case of a double whistle, we want our mechanics to be clean. Fist up, confirm, then signal. Especially as the outside official, we don't want to give a preliminary signal when the play is not in our primary. Okay, so exactly what uh, he talked about. The officials down there wants that call, and bam, 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 he's going to have it. But he goes up with that, uh, oh, wow, well, I'm going the other way. Well, what if I call the block? Okay, anyways, so what we talked about, let's make sure that the proper official is making that call. Yeah, and then Doug. All right, next play. <laughs> Doug, to jump into that one. I know we talked about yes. this last week with Mike Lloyd and Jessica, but uh, it's a point point of emphasis, or the WOA is really big on us stopping the clock, right? So posting the foul first, and that's going to help us with double whistles, and then also help us determine whose primary that is when we do have a double whistle. So putting a fist up prior to doing the little dance that that guy did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. I can't say I've never done that, but God, I hope I'm not on film anywhere. <laughs> All right, here's the second one. This one is just a basic uh, block charge. Um, they'll go into it in a second here. Um, but um, just uh, as Stacy puts it up there, uh, we'll, the play, we'll go through the play. Stacy, we don't see it quite yet. Oh, so just oops. let us know when you're sharing. I thought I was, so I, I will. No, uh, no worries. I will do that. Just give me a second. Thank you. Share screen. Um, I believe it's here. My bad. Here I was enjoying. Yeah, the, I was enjoying the play. <laughs> yeah, we can see it now. <laughs> I was trying to talk and. <laughs> On this play, the lead is official is responsible for the secondary defender. He's officiating this play for a possible block charge, for uh, absence of vertic verticality, for elbow contact here. The trail official is responsible for the primary defender on the play. The primary defender is red one and needs to stay with the play and get this push by Red One on our airborne shooter. We're dividing the responsibilities of who's officiating what. Lead is responsible for secondary defender on a drive to the lane. The trail needs to stay connected on the primary defender and also ready to make any calls on obvious fouls in their secondary. Any questions? You know, that's pretty straightforward again. You know, the, the defender pushes the other player in there and the lead has good patience on there, does not allow, uh, doesn't make a call, lets the trail make that call. So I thought that was a really good play. All right, if there's no questions, let's move on to the next uh, slide. Okay, just give me a second. No problem. Stop share, share screen. All right, slide. All right. And Suzanne Next had a good is... point in the chat, Doug, just really quick, sorry. Okay. Suzanne says in the oh, chat, okay. yeah, she says in the chat, communication is critical on your success. And so that goes back to starting the communication in the pregame, which relates to the question earlier. Even if we show up to the gym dressed, still make time to have that pregame because that's the start of the communication, right? That's the start of the success. So. Absolutely. 
All right, sideline coverage. Coverage. Uh, thank you, Stacy. She added some graphics to this for me. It's basic sideline coverage. So your lead is responsible. Uh, you see the L down there for the baseline and the closest sideline all the way to the opposite end line. The trail uh, up there in the top there is responsible for the closest sideline, the midcourt line, and the backcourt end line. Um, if you happen to have a some backcourt pressure, uh, it may cause the trail to take all lines in the backcourt. Like if you've got two to four people in the backcourt, the leads um, watching the other six players and the ball happens to go out on the lead sideline, they may have a whistle, but they may not have a clue as to whose ball it should be. So let's be aware <laughs> of that, talk about that in pregame. Um, but uh, the trail may have to make that call. All right, moving on to three-point shot coverage. Um, again, um, be sure to discuss this in pregame. Um, so on three-point shots, um, the lead has the small area there from the uh, basically the free throw line on down on their sideline. Um, make sure uh, the lead is ready to assist the trail in a transition play. So we have um, a quick transition and maybe a shot goes off and the trail hasn't made it down. The lead may need to help mark that three point shot to help the uh, trail who may not have a good look at it. Again, talk about this in pregame. Um, obviously the trail has everything else. Um, the, uh, if it's in a gray area, um, release, usually release it to the trail. We don't need both of us going up on a three-point shot. We don't need four eyes on the same play. So if both the lead and the trail go up in a gray area, lead usually drop it, let the trail take that. Um, and if you have a question, if the goal, the goal is to get it right. If one person marks a three or, um, and uh, it, you have 100% knowledge, the foot was on the line, blow your whistle and just change it in, at the book. Change it at the table. Don't wait till the next dead ball. If you have 100% knowledge, and that's, again, a communication in pregame, I trust my partners. If someone says a foot's on the line, I believe them. Let's get it right and fix it right now. All right, rebounding coverage. Um, obviously, we have the uh, nice uh, uh, graphic up there that Stacy just put up there. You have the triangle where the, the trails area is and the uh, other where the lead is. In the paint, there can be some gray area depending on uh, uh, where the uh, push or rebound or action is. Um, lead and trail take responsibility for their side of the court. Dual coverage in the paint, but trail usually has a better look on pushes from behind. Uh, the trail cannot Trail, make sure you're not backing out on rebounding coverage. Work for angles. Um, on, when a shot goes up, the trail should step down and look for pushes from behind to get angles on the rebounding and help with that. Um, one key for this is clean, clean up the rebounding early um, because this, the rough play uh, begins early. You can take care of that and you will have a much better game in the end. Uh, moving on to transition. And this is just some basic philosophy. The trail should stay behind the play, keeping all 10 players in view uh, and an angle on ball action. Uh, the lead should get to the baseline as quickly as possible based on game action. Obviously, if you've got a press, you will have to adjust that. If the ball is coming down the center of the court, or opposite third of the court, the lead should go immediately to close down. So don't run down the sideline of the court and then once you get to the baseline, go to close down. Cut that angle and get to close down as quickly as possible on your side of the court. Um, if the ball is coming down on the nearer third of the court, the lead should mirror the ball position, okay? Um, and one other thing in transition, the lead, should have their head turned and be running forward and looking back. Uh, too often you'll see officials just run with their head facing the other direction, not watching what's going on. So we want to make sure we're looking back and seeing what's going on with the play. 
All right. Uh, bump and run. So basically a ball goes out of bounds on the trail side in front court and you're going the other direction. Um, it's just a positioning thing. So the trail calls the out of bounds. Uh, they point at the spot where it's gonna come in and the trail will go down and be the new lead on the opposite side of the court. And the lead who is on the opposite side of the court will come near side and inbound the ball and bring the ball in. And one thing I'm just gonna jump in, the, the lead, the old lead takes all the backcourt throw-ins when you're going down the floor. It doesn't matter which sideline they come in on, it's always gonna be that person. Thanks, Stacy. Um, all right, uh, backcourt coverage with pressure. Um, hey, Doug, playing? really quick. Yes. We got, got a question in the chat. Uh, Brett says, if lead marks a three, trail mirrors slash signals on a make, lead never mirrors a trail's signal, correct? That is absolutely correct. Yes. So basically what he's saying is um, the lead marks a three pointer, okay? And uh, ball goes through the hoop. Both uh, lead and the trail will go touchdown, okay? If a trail marks a three and the ball goes through the hoop, only the trail will be um, uh, signaling touchdown. Okay, very good question. Thank you, Brett. Yeah, I don't know how we left that out. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot. All right, so uh, back. All right, going back on the, on the uh, slides, uh, backcourt coverage with uh, pressure. When the play moves from one end line towards the other, the trail has the primary responsibility in the backcourt. However, when there's defensive pressure in the backcourt, sometimes the lead must help. There's a general rule when the lead helps the trail on backcourt. If there are four or fewer players in the backcourt, the trail works alone there. More than four players, the lead helps. When there's more than four players in the backcourt, the lead is positioned near the division line. If all the players are in front in backcourt, the lead may move closer to the backcourt end line for better angles. If some players are in the front court, however, the division line area is the best position. When near the division line, the lead must stay wide and constantly glance from backcourt to front court. That swivel glance allows the lead to help the trail with backcourt traffic plus watch players in the front court. The lead should be ready to help on out of bounds calls, long passes and possible infractions involving the division line. The lead will also cover quick breaks and long passes keeping the players boxed in. Um, so, and also you need to be ready if it comes across, a pass comes across the court uh, even if it's on the other side of the court, the lead may have to make that bang, bang call and be ready for that. Questions on that? All right. Nope. Moving on to the button hook. Um, uh, there are times when officials get beat down court on fast breaks, especially in two person. That's okay. In fact, if you're so worried about not getting beat, you're probably leaving the lead official hanging alone with all rebounding action. A definite no-no. When you do get beat down court, there's no need to panic. There's a simple movement, the button hook, that can eliminate straight lining and then allow you to officiate the play correctly from behind. Um, too often, an official who is trailing a fast break sprints as fast as possible, um, sometimes with their heads down to stay even with the players. Staying even with the players is almost about as the worst thing you can do for your angles. Either get ahead of the play and let the play come to you comfortably or officiate the play from behind. Staying even means you're looking through bodies and guessing. When officiating play from behind, swing towards the middle of the court roughly at the intersection of the lane line and the free throw line. Momentarily pause there to watch for action. Um, referee the defense. That movement allows you a good angle to observe potential contact. 
when that part of the play is over, swing back out towards the sideline and the end line to get into proper position. Uh, be aware of players coming from behind you. You should be well ahead of the second wave of players coming down the court. They'll see you in the middle of the court and avoid contact. Make sure your, you position, your position in the center of the court is momentary. You want to move out of there before the second wave comes down. If you feel pressure from players behind you, think safety first. The main thing on the button hook, the reason you want to stop is when your head's bobbing up and down, you don't see the play well. So pause so you can get a good look and then move back into position. And one thing, I might, add is, one thing I might add, Doug, real quick, is that this, this mechanogram is a little extreme. Most of the time when you when you that button hook and step on the floor, you're out here somewhere. You're not like on top of the free throw line. So this is this picture is a little bit uh, over the top, but it, it does give you the right idea. All right, Stacy, turning it over to you. Okay, thanks, Doug. Okay, we're going to talk about throw-ins pretty quickly. Okay, for throw-ins, uh, general rule of thumb. Well, well, actually, not a rule of thumb. It's the rule. Uh, front court, end line throw-ins. The official hands the ball to the thrower in. The two, the, uh, all the rest of the floor, the two sidelines in the back court end line. Uh, you can bounce the ball to the thrower in and then take a step back so that you have uh, a wider angle uh, of better peripheral vision. Um, <clears throat> whenever you do hand the ball to a player, you want to be to their outside, except when the throw-in is going to happen outside the three-point line, the lead can remain inside and hand the ball out. But everywhere else on the floor, the throw-in is <clears throat> always going to be outside the thrower in so we can box the players in. Uh, the officials are responsible for throw-ins for the out-of-bounds call and the throw-ins on the lines for which they're responsible. So on this left play, the lead's responsible for any action on the end line and on the sideline here. And the trail's responsible for, for this sideline in the front court. <clears throat> a, something that I'm always telling the new officials is that when you are the official not, uh, administering the throw-in, don't look at the thrower in. Look at the action on the floor because oftentimes there'll be a screen right in front of you or somebody's gonna push through or grab a shirt or whatever. Uh, that's why it's helpful when you are able to bounce the ball to get away from this player so you can keep them in your periphery but still referee the matchups on the floor. Okay, so in this first picture, the lead's got the throw in outside, hands the ball, does their count, uh, chops the time in, okay? Picture over here, the ball goes out on the sideline, on the lead sideline, below the free throw line extended. So the lead's just gonna uh, maintain lead position and bounce the ball up to the inbound spot. If the ball went out of bounds above the free throw line on the lead side, then the lead would come up and become the trail to administer the throw in and the trail would come down and become the new lead. Okay, um, trail throw-ins are, are pretty much what I uh, mentioned for lead. There's, uh, there's fewer exceptions. Pretty much the ball goes out on the trail sideline. The trail's gonna administer it. Standing outside the thrower in, watching the players on the floor as the throw-in occurs. Um, when, most of, when the players are spread out on, over the whole front court, the lead should probably uh, keep their position opposite the side from the trail. But if all these players start leaking onto the trail side of the floor, it's a good time for the lead to come across and ref and try to help out. Because if you stay over on the on the, the side you're supposed to be on, you're really not much help to the trail. So you can come across here and maybe referee these matchups here till the throw, throw ins complete. Floor balances back out, you move back to the position you started from. Hey Stacy, couple questions in the chat. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Brett asks, is the five second count audible or silent? It's silent. Okay, and then he also asked, does the trail in picture one have an arm extended to chop the clock to mimic the lead? That I don't know. Somebody help me out with this. I think they do. I think yes. they, they, yes, they do. Yes, they do. 
Yes. 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 In high school. Yes. You're going to. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So um, um, I also want to make one additional point in that second slide there. Um, if you get a pass that gets dumped right down into that post, then that lead, if uh, you're, you're on that strong side, it has, is in perfect position to make the call if there's any contact and be able to um, uh, referee that play right in front of them. So um, if you've got everything on the other side of the court, I strongly suggest you at least start your, your action, start play on that uh, strong side two person. Thanks, Doug. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, and this is this is a nit point of mine, especially when you're the lead and you're handing the ball. Um, I I prefer that the official hand the ball with their with the hand closest to the thrower in and do their count with the opposite arm so that they don't inadvertently whap the thrower in with their arm when they're counting. Does that make sense? So count with your ar the arm farther away from the thrower in. Okay, I think this is probably our one to maybe I only have two two sections to go. Um, Thirty-two. <clears throat> okay, basic stuff on fouls. Person who calls the foul stands still and vocalizes color number foul and consequence. Okay, and then hustles to the reporting area, but doesn't go through the players. Goes around the players to report the foul to the table. The, uh, the off official, while keeping the players in their viewpoint, is going to go down to the position they're going to assume, assume after the foul has been reported to the table. So in this instance, the lead calls a foul, he runs around the players into the reporting area, and you can be anywhere in the reporting area. You can be right here if that's where you want to be. You don't have to run right to the middle of the floor. Okay. And does his report, again, color number file consequence, while at the same time, the trail is keeping the players in, the, in his or her periphery, and then it's going to run down to the throw-in spot. So when, the, when this report's done, this referee should already be here so we can be efficient and keep the game moving. Of course, once this person uh, reports to the table, then they become the trail. Okay. Um, on the other play here, the lead calls the foul again, and the same sequence, color number foul consequence, while still hustle to the reporting area, report to the table. At the same time, the trail is going to watch the action, come down to administer the throw-in. But this time, since the throw-in is going to happen here, the old lead, new trail is going to be the trail on the opposite side of the floor. Um, and... <clears throat> In this play, there's a there's a foul in the back um, there's a foul in the front court that's go going to result in the play going down to the other end of the floor. So the lead, the old lead, calls the foul, runs around the players, reports the foul, and keeps going to the other end of the floor, while the trail goes down to administer the throw-in. Um, one thing I can say is that when you're refereeing a, a single game or a you know school game. Um, you want to do do it this way all the time because these are proper procedures. But if you're refereeing four rec games in a row, um, this this running all the way down the floor gets a little tiring, and it makes the game it, it makes the games uh, slow down a little bit. So you know it's it's fine to bend the rules a little bit or bend the mechanics a little bit in that situation, unless you're working with a new official who wants to do it the right way. Then then you know be kind and do it the right way at least for a game. And uh, before you go into your lazy ways. Okay, if there's going to be free throws, uh, the only difference between files with free throws and files without free throws is that the calling official is always going to become the trail table side. So in this instance, there might not be a switch, whereas on all non-free throw fouls, the, the lead and the trail are going to switch positions. So in this instance, the trail calls a foul in his or her primary area, turns around, reports the foul, and stays right there as the trail table side. In the second picture here, trail calls a foul again, reports the foul, becomes trail table side. 
I don't have a picture of it, but if the lead made the call, then the lead would come out, report the foul, and it would become the trail, and then the trail would go down to become the lead and administer the free throws. Okay. Free throw coverage. The lead. The lead has the lowest person on their lane line plus everybody on the other side. The trail has everybody else. So the free throw shooter, the high two opposite, and anybody behind the three point line. Um, the lead's positioning uh, on all but the last uh, free throw, the lead wants to say just one step off the floor and kind of in a closed down position. Um, on the last free throw, or the potentially last free throw, the lead wants to go out a little bit wider and be ready to officiate rebounding. Uh, the trail, on the other hand, wants to make sure that he or she can see the feet of the shooter and these players over here while being able to keep everybody else in their periphery. So you don't want to be too low or too high. You, you just have to find the sweet spot to do that. And then once the shot goes up on the right side here, then the trail again needs to take a step down, like we talked about after any shot attempt. Okay, I think we're down to our last piece. Thank you everyone for hanging on. I know we're running right hour, a little bit past our hour. So substitutions. This is one of those things that when, you, when we do it right, nobody notices, it looks smooth. When we don't do it right, we, we kind of look like clowns out there sometimes. So um, on throw-ins, the non-administering official is responsible for subs. So whoever's not handing the ball to the thrower in is going to be the referee that's going to call the subs in and control them until the transaction is complete. On a free throw, the trail official is the person responsible for the substitutes. So in this instance, on the left, the lead's going to be inbounding the ball. The trail here is going to recognize the subs, beckon them on, keep their arm up and control them until we only have five players left on the floor and then drop their arm and then the lead can inbound the ball. In this situation on the right, it looks like we're going down the floor. The trail, again, this, the administering official is here. So this official is gonna be the one managing the substitutions. Okay, and to finish the presentation, I have another one of these uh, plays uh, with a talk over explaining some of the positioning. In this case, the officials probably weren't quite as good as in the first time around, but it's, it's a, it, an, an interesting clip. All right, where's my uh, share screen? on can you see that yeah we yes. can see okay We've got a non-competitive matchup here. We've got a player passing the ball, and we've got post action on the opposite block. This is our most competitive matchup, but we do have engagement by players here as well, challenging as a result. Note the body position with the shoulders turn. So no awareness of what's going on here, right? That's just something we have to recognize. It's a consequence of the situation. But lead official is saying, I've got this matchup 100%. Trail official has the on-ball matchup, right? Observes the play, makes a ruling. Perfect. We love the conviction, right? So this looks, this looks like a, cum a situation where we're making a cumulative judgment. The white player using his arms to pin the defensive player, but the defensive player is grabbing the arms.
but they are engaged, right? So we're grabbing both ways, right arm by white, left arm by black. We're in the third period. We would have assumed that this action was cleaned up previously, but it hasn't been. Probably the assessment was just cumulatively. There's too much going on in each direction. How can we resolve this? And goes to the double foul. We're going to report. Would we describe this as a typical play? No, this is an atypical play. So we'd want communication between the officials. Where is the resulting throw-in going to be? It would be where the ball was when the foul occurred. The resulting throw-in would be here. There will be no free throws shot. On a double foul, we go to point of interruption. We have the white bench right here. We're going to inbound the ball right in front of the white bench. They are not fans of this call. They feel that their player was fouled. Okay, so this calling official is going to have to choose his reporting area. We would say take the high road. Go around the players here and report here. So that if there's any negative energy or comments coming from the bench, that it has to be a very public situation. Let's look at this on-ball matchup that the trail is officiating. Look at the relative competitiveness of this matchup. Does this deserve proximity on the court and telescoping that this is the only thing the trail is looking at? No, it does not warrant that. This position on the court as the trail is not good and pays dividends down the road where we're not in great position here. So we've got unofficiated players here because of the way that the crew is focused. And we've got an eye formation. Trail, in this instance, we'd expect them to be here. 28-foot line, open look on the play, and able to, with body position, open to the players. But now we have out of position, not open to the players. So this official's looking here. This official's looking here. There's nothing... We can't see off ball. Now, two-person mechanics, it's the Wild West. We cannot see all the action. That's a given. But we want to be in the best position possible, right? So this screening action here is unofficiated. This is obviously not part of the clip, but we have no chance. If something, you know, if we had an elbow by the screener and this kid ends up with a bloody nose, we cannot see that. And that's related to our position and right, our fundamentals. This initial position here leaves us out of position here. And then ultimately, when the ball is passed here, we're out of position for that as well. If we were here for this action with a body open to the court, we'd have a better position to be aware of this action and could position adjust to have an open look on this play when the player receives the ball. We end up with a trail official who is at the volleyball intersection, which is almost always a bad place to be as trail. Positives. Lead official recognizes this is the matchup that needs attention, and that's fantastic. There's a lot of cumulative action going on. It's not what we would expect in the third period, the end of the third period in a game. We would have thought that our, the way we've approached the game had cleaned this action up, but it is what it is. Ruling comes, and the ruling is decisive. Fantastic, right? I have a foul. I have a double foul. He's making the proper move around the players here, knowing that this is harm's way over here. This is fantastic. Right? So a lot of positives. Room for improvement. Trail position here, not good. This on ball matchup does not need this level of proximity and focus. We need to have an open look on the play, but that could be achieved from here. So we're too far onto the court. Okay. So he's just going to keep reviewing what he already said, but. I think this this uh, this clip is a really good example of why we need to adhere to the positioning fundamentals. Um, it's hard enough with three officials. It's impossible with two if if we're not fundamentally sound. Um, so that's what I have. Um, I had one other play, but it's late, so I'm just going to uh, open it up to see if uh, people have questions or. 
Uh, anybody else wants to pipe in? I'll just say thank you so much, Doug and Stacy. And um, if, if people need to drop off, feel free to do so. If people want to stay on and you want to share that last clip, Stacy, that would be awesome as well. Um, I did see a question. Well, not a question, but I saw uh, your note in here, Ken. Basically, for anyone who joins these meetings, you need to provide either a screenshot or a picture of you attending to the board in order to get meeting credit. Um, if you if you don't know how to take a screenshot, just pull your cell phone out and take a picture of the screen and just submit it to the board, and then you should get meeting credit. So Ken, they should send it to uh, to to Mike Lloyd, the membership chair, is who it needs to go to specifically. Awesome, thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Any other questions? Anyone have any questions? questions? Wow, no questions? Nothing? Thanks to you guys. That was great. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne. <laughs> well, again, it's thank fun. you very much, uh, Doug and Stacy, for um, investing your Thanks, time Suzanne. up for, uh, to make our academy work. And uh, we really appreciate it. Okay, and if anybody wants to stay on, I'm going to show one other coverage play. It's not, it's really short compared to the other ones. And uh, okay, all right, so, go for it. Here we go. Um, I think this is it. Some yeah. great clips you got there, huh? Well, those are some great clips you have there. Uh, working on it, right? Let me see if I can find the clip that I really want. Share I screen. wish they were there when I was a young official. <laughs> right? The guy tells me exactly how to do it. That's I actually good. found those clips online looking for two-person uh, clips. There's a lot on there. So, um, you know, if you get a chance, check out the, the internet. Uh, um, there's a lot of clips out there. Okay, I'm just trying to bring this one up. Patient, be patient. All right, so now I'm going to share screen. Federally's on here. You do two person, Scotty? I thought I might learn something. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta think basketball, right? You got to take our test pretty soon. All right. Can you guys see this? Yes. Okay. This is going to be a handoff screenplay, and I'm not. I'm just going to talk through it instead of because the 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 voiceover is not uh, very complete. So we have this play coming down the floor from the trails area, going away from the trail. Okay. Notice where all the defenders are. They're all up here. So what's the trail? What's the lead looking at? Nothing, obviously, because there's no call in this play. Okay. So the, the ball's coming across the top. I would like the trail to stay a little more connected. And with these players here, I'm thinking if I'm the trail, I'm watching this matchup, but I'm also looking for a screen from, you know, so basically I'm trying to officiate this action here. Okay. Um, but I, I'd still like to take a step onto the floor instead of staying glued to the sideline. Okay. So that happens, no, there's no, nothing illegal going on. Again, the lead, nothing really here. Maybe something could happen here, not sure, but this player leaves his primary, okay? And watch what happens. That, that damn handoff screen is <coughs> always this. Right there. And it freed up the shooter and let him score. So, um, like I said in the very, very beginning of the presentation, you know, our primary coverage areas are little dotted lines on a piece of paper, but um, they need to be flexible like everything else and um, need to assess each situation differently. So, 
that's just one little thing I found today when I was poking around that I thought I could I could add. Okay, that's it. Thanks. For me. No problem. Next next up, Suzanne is the uh, is the uh, apprentice training. I'm, I'll be using some of this stuff. And uh, yeah, I'll get working on that. I know. I promise to do. Guys, remember there's a session tomorrow night too. Three person coverage. Just a reminder. Same yep. time, same same bat time, same bat channel. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks Please everybody for us. showing up. Yeah. Thank you very much. Question. Thank you. Yes. Thank you guys. Thanks, everyone. Who had a question? I had a, question. Uh, I had a kid join us last year as an apprentice, but obviously no games this year. Are you going to open the apprentice training up to the second and third year? You know, the apprentice training initially is going to be online, and anybody who wants to to chime in and and you know listen in and watch, they're they're free to join. So. We're going to be um, posting the the Zoom links on the web, the PMBWay.org website, and um, yeah, anybody is welcome to join. In fact, I'm going to send out a reminder, an encouraging email to all of last year's apprentices, just uh, especially the ones who were in the class in January and February because they never got to work a game. They went through the training and then that was it. So yeah, feel free to let people know and and have them come join us. Okay, thank you. We don't want to lose those third year officials. We need yep. them. Nope. Yep. Good okay. question, Peyton. Thanks, Stacy, for thanks, all everyone. your work. I'm gonna, yeah, thanks, Stacy and Doug. I'm going to end right. the meeting now. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye. Good night.